हेलो गाइस सो टुडे वी शेल बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट नियोनेटल जॉन्डिस ओके सो ए नियोनेट इज सेट टू बी हैविंग जॉन्डिस व्हेन द बिलोरुबिन लेवल इज मोर देन 5 मिलीग्राम्स पर डीएल सो वी शेल बी डिस्कसिंग द कंप्लीट कांसेप्ट ऑफ व्हाट इज अ नॉर्मल बिलोरुबिन एक्सक्रीशन मैकेनिज्म दैट इज हैपनिंग इन योर बॉडी आफ्टर दैट वी शेल अप्लाई द क्लिनिकल पॉइंट्स ऑन दैट राइट so this will be the part 1 lecture and in the part 2 lecture we will be discussing much more detailed about the most important points and the only important points which you need to know for your exams right so this is the basic thing which i am trying to frame up in your mind now as i already told you a neonate is said to be having jaundice when the bilirubin level is more than 5 mg per dl right so if the bilirubin level if the serum bilirubin level is more than 5 mg per deciliter then it is said to be jaundice the neonate is said to be having a jaundice right so let us start the mechanism first now what is the mechanism before i explain the mechanism let me just give you an outline of this picture over here as you know in the right hypochondriac region i have got my liver and in the left hypochondriac region i have got my spleen right so this will be my splenic artery and this will be my hepatic artery okay now this c shape structure which you can see here this c shape structure is called as the duodenum and obviously lying within the loop of the duodenum you have got your pancreas okay now another important thing is that this is your gall bladder this is your gall bladder right now coming out of the gall bladder this duct which you have here this is called as cystic duct that is cystic duct next important thing is that this is called as your right hepatic duct okay that is called as your right hepatic duct and here you have got your left hepatic duct okay so one is your right hepatic duct another one is your left hepatic duct the right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct together join to form common hepatic duct what is common hepatic duct look this one is your common hepatic duct okay now this common hepatic duct along with the cystic duct together formed another duct here right so this duct is called as common bile duct what is this duct this is called as common bile duct right now this common bile duct all the way it comes here so what is this black color duct which have drawn in between within, within the pancreas this is the only duct which you find in the pancreas and this is called as the main pancreatic duct okay now the main pancreatic duct main pancreatic duct is joining with the common bile duct but anyways let me write it down so what is the name of this duct this is your main pancreatic duct this is your main pancreatic duct now all of you know that this particular main pancreatic duct what is it happening main this main pancreatic duct is fusing with the common bile duct main pancreatic duct fuses with the common bile duct to form another duct right what is the name of this duct so this duct is formed by the contributions from liver the contributions from the pancreas so it should be hepato pancreatic duct and this particular duct you call it as hepato pancreatic duct what is the name of this duct guys this particular duct which is which you can see here right so this duct is called as hepato pancreatic duct hepato pancreatic duct another important thing is that surrounding this hepato pancreatic duct and by the way hepato pancreatic duct is opening into which part of the duodenum obviously it is opening into the duodenum like this which part of the duodenum you know you have got uh, four parts of the duodenum what are these four parts of the duodenum see this is called as upper horizontal part this is called as lower horizontal part okay so upper horizontal part and it is coming down so descending part of the duodenum then lower horizontal part and then it is going up like this so this is called as a ascending part of your duodenum okay so right now your hepatopancreatic duct is opening into what it is opening into your descending part of the duodenum 
Now, surrounding this hepatopancreatic duct, surrounding this hepatopancreatic duct, you have got a very special sphincter like this. As you can see, you have got a very special sphincter that is surrounding this hepatopancreatic duct and this sphincter is called as sphincter of OD. Right? Anyways, that has nothing to do with our discussion of uh, bilirubin excretion right now. So, this is just the brief anatomy part. Okay? And the next thing you need to know is that uh, from the duodenum, now when I drew duodenum here, don't think, don't think that uh, I'm focusing mainly on the duodenum. No. My, my main intention is that I am focusing on your entire GIT. Okay? All from your duodenum all the way down till the colon. So, as a symbol of that, I have just drawn the duodenum here. Okay? Just think, this part is entirely your intestine. It continues as your intestine completely. Okay? Now, all these are the veins. Right? All these are the veins. All the veins together they join to form a special vein here. And this vein is called as portal vein. So, all of you, all of you are aware of this, right? So, this part is called as your portal vein. Portal vein. And what is happening to the portal vein, guys? This portal vein, all the way it enters into the liver. And this portal vein is draining into another vein here. Now, what is this vein, where this portal vein is draining into? This vein is called as inferior vena cava. What is this vein? IVC, which stands for inferior vena cava right so this is your inferior vena cava and finally you know very well inferior vena cava drains into your right part of your heart i mean the right atrium of your heart so this is the basic thing this is the basic thing you have to know so let me explain you after knowing the skeleton let me explain you the concept so regarding the bilirubin excretion all of you know few terms like there are some things called as conjugated bilirubin in the same way there are some more things called as unconjugated bilirubin so what is this conjugated what is this unconjugated where are they going how are they getting formed we shall be discussing right now now the normal span of your rbc is about 120 days you know rbc cells after 120 days right so they go to the spleen and they get ruptured over there, right? So the, the RBC cells, they die over there. So how are they exactly dying? That is the point where our concept starts. So if you can see here, guys, you know, RBC is biconcave, all of you know it, right? So this is the biconcave shape RBC cell. Okay? Now this RBC, RBC, when it is broken down, within the RBC, what do you have? You have what? Hemoglobin. So, within the RBC, I have got hemoglobin. Okay? Now, this hemoglobin is having two parts. See, hemoglobin. This hemoglobin is having two parts. One is called as heme. Another one is called as globin. Right? So, it is having two parts. So, hemoglobin is broken down into two parts. One is called as heme. Another one is called as globulin. Heme and other one is called as globulin. Right? So what is globulin? Globulin is just a normal protein. What is globulin? Globulin is just a normal protein. So proteins break down into amino acid. Right? So globulin will break down into many different amino acids. So there are different kinds of amino acids over here. But what is the important thing is that, what, what is the fate of this heme? What is the fate of this heme is that, look here guys, heme, what is the fate of this heme is, heme will convert into a special compound and that is called as bilveridin. Heme will convert into a special compound that is called as bilveridin. And this reaction is happening with the help of an enzyme, heme oxygenase. What is that enzyme, guys? So I'm, I'm writing that I'm writing that enzyme here. So that enzyme is heme oxygenase, right? Heme oxygenase. And all of you know this thing that uh, this bilveridin is a tetrapyrrolic structure. Okay, 
and this bilveridin is basically green in color okay it is green in color which imparts green color to the bile your bile is green in color right why because of this pigment called as bilveridin okay now this bilveridin what will happen it is it is it will be further broken down look here this bilveridin will further it will break down into your actual compound that is bilirubin it will break down into your actual compound and this is what is called as your bilirubin and there should be an enzyme there should be an enzyme to convert this bilirubin into bilirubin what is that the enzyme is bilirubin reductase okay so let me write it down here the name of the enzyme is bilveridin reductase bilveridin reductase so i'm rubbing this part guys serum bilirubin if it is more than 5 mg per dl you call this condition as a neonatal jaundice right a neonate is said to be having jaundice when the serum bilirubin is more than 5 mg per dl i hope you know this thing by now right so finally what did we produce what did we produce is that we have synthesized bilirubin clear now what bilirubin is this there are two types of bilirubin one is called as conjugated bilirubin and the other one is called as unconjugated bilirubin now this bilirubin which is produced is what it is unconjugated bilirubin okay so i'm simply writing it as ub ub stands for unconjugated bilirubin okay this is ub which stands for unconjugated bilirubin now what is your concept of conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin look here you have got two types of bilirubin as i told you one is called as conjugated bilirubin conjugated bilirubin and on the other hand you have got un conjugated bilirubin okay so what is your concept of this conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin look here now what is your concept of this conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin conjugated bilirubin that is a polar compound conjugated bilirubin is a polar compound i'll, I'll let you know everything in a minute so this is basically a polar compound okay so if it is polar can i can i tell polar compounds are water soluble yes polar compound or it is water soluble it is water soluble but when you look at unconjugated bilirubin unconjugated bilirubin is non polar so this is non polar compound or i can tell it is water insoluble water insoluble unconjugated bilirubin is water insoluble so what you are trying to tell us what i am trying to tell you is that the blood the blood here it is a polar compound this bilirubin which is released is unconjugated bilirubin that is a non polar compound now you tell me will this non polar compound mix with the polar compound no non polar and polar they don't sync so what should i do i cannot stop the reaction here i have to further take this bilirubin into the blood for further processes so what should i do is that i will mask this bilirubin i mean this unconjugated bilirubin whatever is there i will mask it how am i going to mask it i am going to mask it or cover it with the protein why are you covering it with the protein because protein is polar blood is polar protein and blood both of them they sync each other right so what i'm doing is that i'm putting unconjugated bilirubin in the center which is a non polar and surrounding that i'm applying a coat or a mask of proteins okay so what i'm exactly doing is that i'm i am exactly coating some protein molecules surrounding this unconjugated bilirubin in this way now now i am ready to take this molecule this unconjugated bilirubin into the blood why because the blood sees only the protein molecule protein is polar so the blood allows that blood is not going to break it down and look at what is there inside right so now what will happen is this unconjugated bilirubin slowly now it enters into the blood this is the unconjugated bilirubin right so 
and unconjugated bilirubin is coated by what protein as i told you now this unconjugated bilirubin travels all the way like this travels all the way so this is your unconjugated bilirubin it is traveling all the way into the blood right now after this where will this unconjugated bilirubin go this unconjugated bilirubin with the it, it will enter into the hepatic artery okay so this unconjugated bilirubin will enter into the hepatic artery slowly and finally this unconjugated bilirubin is in the hepatic artery this particular unconjugated bilirubin is right now in your hepatic artery clear you understood now how does a non polar compound enter into the blood and end, finally ended up in the liver so through the hepatic artery this unconjugated bilirubin went and ended up in the liver now what is going to happen to this unconjugated bilirubin look here now this unconjugated bilirubin is going to conjugate it means it is going to mix up with something conjugation is a process of mixing so this unconjugated bilirubin is going to mix up with something what is it going to mix up with unconjugated bilirubin is going to mix up with a special compound called as udp udp stands for uridyl diphosphate so unconjugated bilirubin will conjugate with udp and after conjugating with udp the resultant molecule which is released is called as conjugate bilirubin this molecule is called as conjugate bilirubin so where is the conjugation happening in the spleen or in the liver in the liver what is the molecule that is responsible for conjugation udp what is the enzyme that is responsible for conjugation guys yeah very important the enzyme the enzyme that is responsible for this conjugation is udp glucuronyl transferase that is udp glucuronyl transferase udp glucuronyl transferase what is what is the importance of this udp glucuronyl transferase what is the importance of this udp glucuronyl transferase many pathologies whatever i'll be discussing with you regarding the jaundice most of these pathologies within this neonate right all of them are related with this enzyme how they are related i'll let you know in a minute okay but for now what you need to believe is that udp glucuronyl transferase is the enzyme that is responsible for conjugating so udp glucuronyl transferase converts this unconjugated bilirubin to conjugated bilirubin now what is the fate of this conjugated bilirubin this conjugated bilirubin this conjugated bilirubin what will happen is either it will enter into the right hepatic duct or it will enter into the left hepatic duct or directly this conjugated bilirubin will enter into the gall bladder right so this is the conjugated bilirubin here and this conjugated bilirubin will travel all the way into the common bile duct and from the common bile duct it will enter into your hepatopancreatic duct and from the hepatopancreatic duct your conjugated bilirubin is released so this is the conjugated bilirubin which is released into the duodenum which part of the duodenum initially obviously it will be descending part of the duodenum clear now this conjugated bilirubin this conjugated bilirubin travels all the way in the duodenum it travels all the way like this just think just think this as a colon okay i know it is a duodenum but just for the convenience sake just think this is as a colon so what i'm trying to explain you what i'm trying to explain you is that guys conjugated bilirubin is right now in the colon right so hypothetically speaking this is colon for example so there is a protein that is covering this right now within your colon you have got your bacteria isn't it the bacteria which you have in your colon is called as normal bacterial flora right there is some normal bacterial flora within your colon so let me let me put up some bacteria over here so these are the normal bacterial flora which are present in your colon so what is happening 
what are these normal bacterial flora doing what they are doing is that guys these normal bacterial flora will convert this conjugated bilirubin into a special compound and that special compound is urobilinogen urobilinogen i'll just simply write it as urb okay so this will be your urobilinogen who is converting it your gut flora the bacterial flora of your gut i mean the colon specially so once urobilinogen is formed what is going to happen what is going to happen is that no matter how much urobilinogen is formed out of this 50% okay out of this 50% will go all the way it will travel all the way and enter into this veins so 50% of urobilinogen is right now in your veins 50% of urobilinogen is right now in your veins and this urobilinogen will enter into the portal vein and from the portal vein the urobilinogen will go up go up go up and finally the urobilinogen will drain into your inferior vena cava and from the inferior vena cava the urobilinogen goes all the way and enters into your right heart obviously if you divide your heart like this so urobilinogen is going to enter into your right heart now what is happening when it enters into your right heart all of you know this thing yeah urobilinogen will descend down into your right ventricle okay urobilinogen is going to descend down into your right ventricle and from here from here when the ventricle pumps what is happening urobilinogen will enter into pulmonary artery and from the pulmonary artery it goes to the lungs and from the lungs it is coming back into what your left atrium this particular urobilinogen this guy is coming into your left atrium so there is no fun in telling that urobilinogen from the left atrium it comes into the left ventricle urobilinogen comes into your left ventricle now again when the ventricle pumps during systole this urobilinogen enters right now into your aorta right so this is the time this is the time for this urobilinogen to rest in the aorta what will happen now what will happen is this urobilinogen enters into your kidney and gets excreted out and gets excreted out what is the color of urobilinogen colorless now what is this you are telling that urobilinogen is colorless but when i pee and see my urine is pale yellow in color how is that possible the reason is look guys not only urobilinogen there are also some more, some more ways right some some of the other ways some of the other you know bilirubin and all of these things mix up in the urine and they impart pale yellow color to the urine but if i extract all of them all the ways and everything and if i only add urobilinogen to the urine it is absolutely colorless okay so in this way 50% of the urobilinogen is coming back and entering into the general circulation portal circulation and from there to the heart to the kidney and finally getting excreted out what is happening to the remaining 50% of urobilinogen the remaining 50% of the urobilinogen look here the, this is the urobilinogen previously now the remaining 50% of the urobilinogen will be converted into another special compound that is called as stercobilinogen another compound that is called as stercobilinogen and mind you stercobilinogen is not colorless you might think that it is coming from urobilinogen and it will be colorless but no stercobilinogen is yellow in color and this stercobilinogen mixes with your feces mixes with your feces and that is the reason why your feces are also yellowish in color and that is why your feces are also yellowish in color so what i am trying to tell you guys that this yellow color feces and colorless urine is basically found in you and me under normal circumstances right so in normal individuals when in you and me when there is normal excretion of bilirubin we have got pale yellow color urine and yellow color stools so this is achieved by in the urine the urine part is achieved by the urobilinogen 
and the fecal part, the yellow color of the fecal part is achieved by the stercobilinogen. Second important thing is that whenever you have got jaundice, whenever you have got jaundice, uh, there will be yellow coloration of your skin and yellow coloration of your sclera. Why there will be yellow coloration of your sclera? Because sclera is basically white. So the yellow color pigment called as bilirubin, it deposits there. Okay. Again, mind you, I am telling you, bilveridin is green in color, but bilirubin is yellow. Bilveridin is green, bilirubin is yellow, stercobilinogen is yellow. So this bil, bilirubin starts depositing in your eyes as it is your white sclera, so white turns to yellow. But why skin? Why the skin is turning to yellow? Why? The reason is, beneath your skin guys, you have got elastic fibers, right? All of you know. You have got elastic fibers to maintain the normal skin texture, targar and all. So these elastic fibers, I mean the bilirubin is highly efficient or it has got high affinity to bind with these elastic fibers very tightly. So bilirubin will very readily go and bind with these elastin fibers and impart yellow color to your skin. Okay. So that is the reason why basically your, uh, uh, your entire body turns to yellow in color. Okay. It is because the bilirubin going and binding with the elastic fibers. Clear. So this is the normal thing. This is the normal mechanism that is happening in your body every day. Every day. Adding upon this normal mechanism, if, if we apply some clinicals on this, let us see how the entire system is going to change. Okay, so let me apply the clinical part. So basically guys, you have got two types of bilirubin as I told you, right? Conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin, right? So one is called as your unconjugated bilirubin. Unconjugated bilirubin. And on the other hand, you have got your conjugated bilirubin. Conjugated bilirubin and unconjugated bilirubin, right? Now, very important thing is that if if there is increase in level of unconjugated bilirubin you call it as unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia if there is increase in level of conjugated bilirubin you call it as conjugated hyperbilirubinemia right so increase in level of unconjugated bilirubin you call it as unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia if there is increase in level of conjugated bilirubin you call it as conjugated hyperbilirubinemia so if 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 there is increase in level of unconjugated bilirubin, how much increase? The increase should be, let us say, somewhere equivalent to 9 milligrams per dl. If basically in case of jaundice, when there is unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, the unconjugated bilirubin level in the blood will be increased to 9 milligrams per dl. In the same way, in the same way, if there is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, how much increase of this conjugated bilirubin will be? The conjugated bilirubin will basically be more than 2 milligrams per dl of the total bilirubin. Okay, of the total bilirubin. We shall be discussing all these values in the next part of the video. This is just a concept forming part. Now, what are the causes of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia? Okay, so from from where till where is the unconjugated bilirubin story guys all the way it starts from the spleen and all the way it goes like this into the liver before it joins with udp so before it joins with udp till here the story of unconjugated bilirubin is there once it joins with the udp then conjugated bilirubin story starts so all this is the conjugated bilirubin story so regarding unconjugated bilirubin we have to discuss Till here before it has got conjugated isn't it so all this reaction is happening where before the liver mainly where mainly where in the spleen right it is happening before the liver so I can I call it as prehepatic jaundice right so anyways I'll tell you what is prehepatic hepatic and post hepatic but for now what you need to know is that what are the causes of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia point number one point number one what is causing the release of unconjugated bilirubin first of all tell me yeah unconjugated bilirubin is released when there is hemolysis of rbc when the rbc breaks down unconjugated bilirubin is released 
for example, if there is excessive breakdown of RBC, if there is excessive hemolysis of RBC, when there is excessive hemolysis of RBC, what will happen? Excessive heme is released. Excessive heme is released in the sense excessive bilirubin is released. If there is excessive bilirubin, then excessive unconjugated bilirubin is released. So what is the point number one, guys? Point number one is that excessive hemolysis, excessive hemolysis of RBC. Now, when I when I tell you this word called as excessive hemolysis of RBC, what are the things that come into it? What causes hemolysis? Normally, hemolysis does not happen, right? Even if it happens, it happens after 120 days. What is the cause of excessive RBC breakdown? The most common cause is hemolytic anemia. I hope all of you know this thing, right? So, what is the most most common cause? The most common cause is Hemolytic anemia. Hemolytic. Now, now you are going to tell me what causes hemolytic anemia. What are the causes of hemolytic anemia? Okay, A. What is the first cause of hemolytic anemia? Obviously, if, if there is RH incompatibility, I hope all of you know what is RH incompatibility. If the father is RH positive, mother is RH negative, and the baby which is in the womb, what will it be? It will also be RH positive, right? If father is RH positive, then the baby in the womb will, will also be RH positive. So right now, this mother, she is RH negative, carrying a RH positive baby, right? So in between both of them, there can be an incompatibility. So that is called as RH incompatibility. So in that condition, all the RBC is going to be destroyed. So what is the first most important condition guys? The first most important condition is RH incompatibility. Right? The first most important condition is RH incompatibility. This, this uh, pathology is also called as he HDNB. Hemolytic disease of the newborn. I hope all of you know this thing, right? HDNB which stands for Hemolytic disease of the newborn. Second important thing, right? What is the second important thing is that all of you know there is a condition. What is that condition? That condition is called as hereditary spherocytosis. So even in case of hereditary spherocytosis, even in case of hereditary spherocytosis, where do you, you find spherocytes? Hereditary spherocytosis. So in this condition of hereditary spherocytosis also, you are going to find hemolytic anemia in the patient. Not only that, not only that, even what are the other things? There is one specific thing that is called as G6PD deficiency, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, right? So when there is G6PD deficiency, right? What is happening is the reactive oxygen species which are present in your body, they are going to attack your RBC. Okay. So another important thing is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. G6PD deficiency. Apart from G6PD deficiency, there is also another condition in the neonates that is called as cephalhematoma. Right. Where there is hematoma that is formed in the brain here. There are two things. One is caput succedemia and uh, cephalhematoma. We shall be discussing them later on. But for now, what you need to know is that, guys, uh, there is another thing that is cephalhematoma. Even cephalhematoma causes hemolytic anemia. Right. Now, apart from these things, are there any other things? Yes, there are a lot of things. We shall be discussing them in the subsequent lecture. So these are the most important things which you need to remember. Hemolytic disease of the newborn, hereditary, spiro hereditary spherocytosis, glucose 6-phosphate deficiency and cephalhematoma. Okay. So all these are the causes of excessive hemolysis. All of them cause excessive hemolysis. Point number two. Apart from excessive hemolysis, what can be the other things that can be caused in the baby? Point number two, what is the next thing? 
what is the next thing where excess amount of unconjugated bilirubin is released yeah there is one important thing there is one important thing see guys normally in you and me normally in you and me uh, hypothetically speaking hypothetically speaking normally in you and me let us say there are uh, 500 unconjugated bilirubin molecules they are released okay just hypothetically speaking 500 rbc have been broken down as a result 500 unconjugated bilirubins are released now these 500 unconjugated bilirubins they travel all the way to the liver out of this 500 all the 500 unconjugated bilirubins will mix with the udp and form 500 conjugated bilirubins this happens in you and me but in the neonates in the newborn right the, the liver of the neonate or the newborn is immature so that neonate is that age group where slowly the organs start to become mature every organ is immature the liver is immature the 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 structure that is surrounding the brain that is a blood brain barrier even that is immature that is very weak so when what do what do i mean by what do i mean by neonate's liver is immature it means all the hepatocytes of the neonate's liver are immature all the enzymes are immature all the biochemical processes which are happening within the liver of the neonate are also immature they are also happening slowly why because the entire system the entire organ is immature because it is a neonate it is slowly developing it becomes mature later on so right now right now in this neonate if 500 rbc have been broken down i am talking about neonate not adults now if 500 rbc have been broken down in a neonate 500 unconjugated bilirubins will be formed these 500 unconjugated bilirubins they will come here see they are 500 unconjugated bilirubins but as the liver is immature as this enzyme udp glucuronyl transferase is also weak inactive do you think all the 500 will be converted to 500 conjugated bilirubins no out of 500 let us say maybe only 100 can be converted because that is the only capacity this neonate is having right now so out of 500 only 100 will be converted and remaining 400 they stay in the blood remaining 400 what remaining 400 unconjugated bilirubins are staying in the blood so in this way time to time now 400 in the next hour again 400 next hour again 400 so in this way what is building up in the blood unconjugated bilirubin again unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia so this this thing which i have explained you right this thing which i have explained you regarding the immaturity of the liver this is present in every neonate so in every neonate you see unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia and that is why they they name this as a physiological jaundice because it is normal in everyone so what is the second reason where there is increase in level of unconjugated bilirubin in case of physiological jaundice in case of physiological jaundice there is increase in level of unconjugated bilirubin clear so when i told about physiological jaundice there is also another type of jaundice later on i'll be telling you that is called pathological jaundice what is the difference between physiological and pathological jaundice is remember one thing physiological jaundice will start after 24 hours uh, exactly to tell simply to tell physiological jaundice will start on the second day but whereas pathological jaundice will start on the first day itself if you see jaundice in the baby in the neonate on the first day it is pathological jaundice if you see jaundice in the baby in the second day then it is physiological jaundice apart from this apart from this there is also another type of jaundice guys there is also another type of jaundice even in that jaundice also the unconjugated bilirubin will be high what is that type of jaundice is breast milk jaundice now what is this breast milk jaundice doctors always tell to feed the baby with the breast milk to breast feed the baby so when 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 the doctors tell the mother to breast feed the baby then why there will be jaundice the reason is within the breast milk there is a, there is one specific chemical okay there is a special chemical 
what is that chemical going to do is that in in the, in every breast milk there will be some chemical that chemical will inactivate this enzyme when it will inactivate this enzyme when the unconjugated come here can it conjugate can it join with udp no when it cannot join with udp do you think conjugated bilirubin will be formed no so what is happening all the unconjugateds they keep on coming but they don't know the reality that udp glucuronyl transferase is inactive because of that chemical so unconjugated bilirubin they do not conjugate and they stay in the blood leading to excess levels of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia what is that chemical that is present in the what is that compound that is present in the blood that is pregnant diol what is that that is that is pregnant diol pregnant diol is present in the breast milk that is responsible for causing jaundice next important thing fourth important thing is that not only breast milk jaundice there is also another thing called as breast feeding jaundice what is that concept of breast feeding jaundice right what is that concept of breast feeding jaundice what is that concept of breast feeding jaundice is that guys for example if mother is not feeding the baby if mother is not breast feeding the baby what will happen is that the if if she is not breast feeding the baby then the fluids are not going to enter into the baby so when that fluids can not going to enter into the baby the baby will become dehydrated when the baby will become dehydrated the baby will become weak when the baby will become weak there won't be any peristalsis peristalsis of your duodenum peristalsis of your intestine when there is no peristalsis do you think whatever conjugated whatever unconjugated is it whatever it is formed is that going to be excreted out without peristalsis no so obviously what will happen there will be build up in level of unconjugated now how to resolve this condition tell the mom to breast feed the baby and the symptoms will resolve so that is called as breast feeding jaundice what is that called that is called as breast feeding jaundice so another important thing is that guys so point number 1 was excessive hemolysis next one was physiological jaundice breast milk and breast feeding jaundice and we have also told pregnant diol is responsible for breast milk jaundice because it inhibits an enzyme glucuronyl transferase right so udp glucuronyl transferase another important thing what is the fifth important thing fifth important thing is that there is a specific syndrome in that syndrome what is going to happen is that this udp glucuronyl transferase enzyme genetically it is going to be hypoactivated there is hypoactivation of udp glucuronyl transferase and what is that syndrome named it as it is called as gilbert syndrome it is called as gilbert syndrome what is gilbert syndrome point number 5 is your gilbert syndrome what is gilbert syndrome is within the gilbert syndrome there is hypoactivity of udp glucuronyl transferase what is that happening guys there is hypo activity of udp glucuronyl transferase right so there will be hypoactivity of your enzyme that is udp glucuronyl transferase fine so for example let us say uh if you if you look at the patient basically this gilbert syndrome is seen in adults okay it is seen in adults for example if uh, i am a patient of gilbert syndrome do you find any uh, any kind of uh, jaundice symptoms in me no the patient having and this gilbert syndrome is present from the birth because i told you genetically this patient is having hypoactivity from the birth itself this patient is having hypoactivity of this udp glucuronyl transferase so in this patient when you look at the patient the patient grows normally he won't have any kind of jaundice but when is he going to having jaundice he will have jaundice only under stressful conditions under normal conditions he is not going to have jaundice you you are not going to see any kind of yellow discoloration of the sclera or the yellow discoloration of the skin you will see those symptoms only when the patient is under stress now what do i mean by patient is under stress for example let us say let us say i am a patient of gilbert syndrome and i have not eaten any kind of food or let us say i am starving from one week 
right so i'm starving since a week so when i'm starving since a week without eating any kind of food are any proteins going to enter into my body no there are no proteins going to enter into my body so because i'm starving i'm not eating anything so proteins are not going to enter into my body so when proteins are not going to enter into my body then what is that organ which is responsible to synthesize proteins obviously your liver it means the workload on the liver is increased right previously you used to take proteins but now you are putting all the work on the liver now the workload on the liver is increased so that liver has to release lots and lots of proteins let us also tell that i also have got infection i have got some kind of bacterial infection or viral infection and i am not taking any kind of medication if i am not taking any kind of medications then these bacteria or virus whatever it might be they release toxins and these toxins are going to damage my blood vessels they going to rupture my blood vessels so there will be bleeding there so when there will be bleeding to clot that bleeding i need clotting factors and who is going to release clotting factors right now again the liver even in this condition also the 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 pressure the the workload on the liver is increased to release a lot of clotting factors so this is called as a stressful condition right in the blood there is a need of proteins so liver has to work more right now liver all the hepatocytes in the liver will work more all the biochemical processes which are happening all the chemical reactions which are happening in the liver they will be hyperactivated the hepatocytes will be hyperactivated even the enzymes which are present in the liver all of them will be hyperactivated so the entire liver is hyperactivated why because there is a need for proteins in the liver so liver has to be hyperactivated to re to release those proteins into the blood there is a need for clotting factors in the blood for that reason liver has to be hyperactivated and the liver has to release a lot of clotting factors into the blood there is also a need for conjugated bilirubin in the blood because we have to excrete conjugated bilirubin so where is conjugated bilirubin released in the liver so so the the workload on the liver is increased too much that liver has to synthesize lots and lots of conjugated bilirubin why because when all the biochemical processes are increased in the liver when all the enzymes are hyperactive in the liver obviously the need for conjugated bilirubin also will increase same like the need for proteins and the need for clotting factors the need for conjugated bilirubin also will increase so liver is going to tell that look i am so hyperactivated now all my enzymes and cells are hyperactive i wanted to synthesize lots and lots of conjugated bilirubin so liver will tell the spleen to send all the unconjugated bilirubin molecules at a, at a time so lots and lots of unconjugated let us say 500 let us say 1000 molecules right 1000 molecules of unconjugated bilirubin are coming to the liver thinking that liver is hyperactive and it would conjugate but when all 1000 molecules of unconjugated bilirubin came here one very important thing is that no matter how much hyperactivated you are no matter how much hyperactivated your enzymes are but the reality is genetically this enzyme is deficient in case of gilbert syndrome so no matter how much activated you are no matter no matter how much you are giving yourself still if there is genetic inactivation you cannot reverse it genetic changes are irreversible changes you cannot reverse it so all the 1000 molecules are coming here but this enzyme is weak out of 1000 only 200 molecules are converting into conjugated bilirubin remaining 800 are present in the blood it means patient is having what unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia why because remaining 800 molecules of unconjugated they stay in the blood so under such stressful conditions under starvation under any kind of infections in your body under such stressful conditions in a patient with gilbert syndrome only then you see symptoms in the patient till then you are not going to see any kind of symptoms in the patient uh otherwise the patients are going to be absolutely normal okay so patients with gilbert syndrome have hypoactivity of udp glucuronyl transferase and 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 another thing to take into the note is that this syndrome is basically found in adults right adults clear point number 6 point number 6 is that what is the next important what can be the next important thing what can be the next important thing is that there is one specific problem right there is another syndrome that is called as krigler 
Najjar syndrome. There is another syndrome that is called as Krigler Najjar syndrome. Now, what is this Krigler Najjar syndrome? Krigler Najjar syndrome, point number one Krigler Najjar syndrome is going to be found in children and it is going to be found in neonates. Right? Krigler Najjar syndrome is seen in children as well as neonates. There are two types in Krigler Najjar syndrome. What are these two types? These two types are Krigler Najjar number one and Krigler Najjar number two. There are two types of CN syndrome. So let me call it as CN syndrome, right? So there is CN1 and CN2. What is the difference? The difference is that in CN1, in CN1, in this particular CN1, there is absence of UDP glucuronyl transferase. There is absence or deficiency of or absence, complete absence of UDP glucuronyl transferase. Complete absence of UDP glucuronyl transferase. But whereas in Kligler Najjar number 2, type 2, there is the UDP glucuronyl transferase is present, but it is hypoactive, right? So there is hypoactive. Hypoactivity of UDP glucuronyl transferase. So what am I trying to tell you? What am I trying to tell you is this particular enzyme in type 1 is completely absent and in type 2 it is hypoactive. Right? It is hypoactive. And where do you see this condition? You see this condition in children and neonates. Now, in Gilbert syndrome I told hypoactivity and even in type 2 krigler najjar also I am telling hypoactivity. Then how do I diagnose? How do I diagnose is that Gilbert syndrome is seen in adults and krigler najjar type 2 is seen in children and neonates. So that is based upon the age barrier, I mean based upon the age difference, I am going to uh, diagnose it. Second thing is that in Gilbert syndrome, symptoms appear only when you are under stressful conditions as I told you. But here, but in this condition, you know what is going to happen? In this condition, neonate, neonate is so weak, the, the enzymes are weak, the liver is weak, the blood brain barrier is weak. So, if, if for, you, you see a neonate where he is suffering from Krigler Nijar type 2, right now in his body, there is hypoactivity of UDP glucuronyl transferase, which means when I am sending 500 molecules of unconjugated bilirubin, due to that hypoactivity, out of 500, only 100 will be conjugated, remaining 400 will stay back in the blood. And that 400, that 400 will cause unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. But in case of neonates, what will happen to that 400 molecules of unconjugated hyperbilirubin are? What is going to happen? I told you the blood brain barrier is also so weak. So this unconjugated bilirubin can very easily pass through the blood brain barrier and, and enter into the brain and cause a condition called as kernicterus. Right? So what do you see here? What do you see in this champ here? You are gonna see kernicterus. You are gonna see what? You are gonna see kernicterus. But ideally speaking, ideally speaking, if a neonate, if a neonate is said to be having kernicterus, the normal amount of bilirubin which he should have, he or she should have, is basically more than, more than 20 milligrams per DL. So more than 20 milligrams per DL of bilirubin is needed to cause kernicterus in a neonate. Clear so far? Then what about absence of UD, UDP glucuronyl transferase in type 1? These children will die. No matter what you do, these children will definitely die. Type 1 children's prognosis is very bad. They are going to die immediately. Okay? So these are the basic causes guys. Excessive hemolysis, physiological jaundice, breast milk jaundice, breastfeed jaundice, Gilbert syndrome, krigler najjar syndrome. These are the most important causes. There are multiple other causes we shall be discussing later on in the subsequent lectures. But right now, these are the most important six causes for unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. What can the other name for this unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia be? When I discuss unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, did I touch the liver? Did I discuss anything regarding the liver 
or the biliary tracts and all no all the discussion was till the liver but not within the liver right so all the discussion started from here all the way all the way it went till here right so all this unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia thing is happening within the liver or before the liver it is happening before the liver so can i call unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia as prehepatic jaundice because it is happening before the liver right the next thing which i am discussing right now will be so the next thing i'm going to discuss is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia we are done with the discussion of unconjugated now we'll be discussing regarding conjugated hyperbilirubinemia conjugated hyper bilirubinemia what is your concept what is your concept of this conjugated hyperbilirubinemia or simply asking what is the reason for this conjugated hyperbilirubinemia what causes this hy conjugated hyperbilirubinemia but before i discuss the causes of conjugated as we discuss like unconjugated before discussing this one thing i want to make sure that where is conjugated bilirubin formed before the liver or within the liver obviously conjugated bilirubin is formed within the liver so i have to start discussing from here clear now what are the causes of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia point number 1 what causes increase in level of conjugated bilirubin normally in a normal patient right there is normal hemolysis for example i am a patient and in me uh, let us say rbc after 120 days they went to the spleen and they have been broken down into unconjugated bilirubin and unconjugated bilirubin all the way they came here and unconjugated bilirubin conjugated with udp and formed conjugated bilirubin in the presence of enzyme udp glucuronyl transferase clear in 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 this case of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia there is no issue with this enzyme okay so enzyme is working normally everything is going well and conjugated bilirubin is also released under normal amount now once conjugated bilirubin is released should i store it in the liver or should i excrete it out what should i do what should i do is that some amount of conjugated i'll i'll uh, run through the right hepatic through the left hepatic through the common bile duct and finally i'll enter into the common bile duct here from the common bile duct the conjugated bilirubin will come all the way into the hepatopancreatic duct here and from the hepatopancreatic duct it comes into the duodenum now all this is the pathway of conjugated bilirubin excretion if there is any trouble in this biliary tract any trouble what do i mean by trouble what do i mean by that is for example for example let us say there is a stone in the cystic duct see there is a calculus in the cystic duct when there is a stone in the cystic duct do you think the conjugated bilirubin which is formed obviously it will enter into the gall bladder but do you think it it is going to be released into the duodenum no it is not going to be released into the duodenum point number 2 let us say there is a stone in the common bile duct now again the same thing conjugated bilirubin will come all the way till here but it cannot go further let us say let us say that there is some tumor there is a malignant tumor exactly near the opening here see there is a malignant tumor exactly near the opening of the hepatopancreatic duct right and by the way that opening is called as hepatopancreatic ampulla okay opening of hepatopancreatic duct is called as hepatopancreatic ampulla so if there is a malignant tumor that is suppressing malignant tumor in the duodenum that is suppressing this hepatopancreatic ampulla do you think conjugated bilirubin is going to be released here no so in this case is what is happening my spleen doesn't know what is happening in the cystic duct common bile duct and in the duodenum my spleen doesn't know that so normally my spleen keeps on releasing unconjugated bilirubin normally my liver keeps on conjugating it normally conjugated bilirubin is increased increased and increased but it cannot go out the outflow tract is obstructed there is obstruction there is there is a obstruction in the outflow or excretion of conjugated bilirubin so in that case what is happening there is increase in level of conjugated bilirubin in these biliary tracts this is called as biliary tract outflow obstruction 
So when there is conjugated bilirubin that is increased in these biliary tracts, you call this condition as conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. There, because of there can be stone in the cystic duct, in the common bile duct, or there can be a malignant tumor here. So what is the first or what is the first important thing that is obstruction? First important thing is obstruction. Obstruction of what? Obstruction of biliary tract. What is the second important thing? Second important thing is that guys there is one condition in that particular actually I can tell that it is an autoimmune condition okay. So in this autoimmune condition my autoantibodies right what these antibodies do is that these antibodies they destroy these biliary tracts it means they, they destroy the common bile duct like this they destroy the right hepatic duct like this they destroy the cystic duct in this way they destroy you know this common bile duct they destroy the hepatopancreatic duct like this so there is destruction of cystic duct right and left hepatic duct common hepatic duct common bile duct why what is happening what is happening is that these antibodies they go there and destroy those things when when they are destroyed do you think conjugated bilirubin once it enters there can it be properly sent into the duodenum there will be leakage it won't be sent into the duodenum so even in this case, you are not sending conjugated bilirubin to the duodenum, which means conjugated bilirubin levels are increased here, right? So this condition, where are my own autoantibodies are damaging this biliary tracts, this condition is called as primary biliary sclerosis. This is called as primary biliary sclerosis now what are those autoantibodies which are causing this damage now the autoantibodies which are causing this damage are anti mitochondrial antibodies what are they anti mitochondrial antibodies anti mitochondrial antibodies are the ones which are causing this destruction Point number three, point number three is what is the next important condition? The next important condition is there is, there is a particular condition guys. In this condition what happens is excess amount of fibers, excess amount of collagen fibers let us say, they start depositing on these biliary tracts. It means look here, there will be excess amount of fibers that will be depositing like this. Excess amount of fibers that will be depositing like this. Now once they are getting deposited what is happening what is happening is that for example uh, take a small pipe okay completely close the pipe like this or tie a rope and completely tie the rope hard, tightly what will happen the lumen will become narrow the lumen will become compressed so these fibers they are depositing surrounding that let us say let us say that this is a biliary tract Okay, let us say this is a part of the biliary tract, normal biliary tract. Now from this normal biliary tract, let us say this is cystic duct or common bile or whatever it might be. From this the conjugated bilirubin comes out. But in this patient what is happening is, this is the biliary tract, right? Now look here, surrounding this, there is a lot of fiber that is getting deposited. Now when there is a lot of fiber that is getting deposited, how how does the center lumen look the center lumen is wide or center lumen became narrow the center lumen became the center lumen became narrow so when it is compressed on when the lumen becomes narrow do you think sufficient amount of conjugated bilirubin can flow into the duodenum no so even in this case you're gonna have conjugated hyperbilirubinemia right and this condition is called as primary sclerosing cholangitis this is called as primary sclerosing because there is a lot of fiber that is deposited leading to sclerosis sclerosing primary sclerosing cholangitis okay and and this particular appearance when you take the cross section of one of the duct and look at that 
This particular appearance is called as onion peel appearance. And what is this appearance called as guys? This is called as onion peel appearance. Onion peel appearance. Clear? So all these things which I've mentioned, there are still more lot of things which we'll be discussing in the subsequent lectures. But right now, all these things which we discussed, these are the most important things that are leading to conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, excess levels of conjugated bilirubin, right? Now, all these are regarding damage to, some of them are obstruction, some of them are damage, right? But whatever it is, problem with the biliary tracts. All these three causes are pointing towards, what? Pointing towards the problem with the biliary tracts. Clear? All these, are, I, can, I can classify all of these as obstructive causes of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Now, when I tell obstructive, there are also some more things which are non-obstructive. It means cystic duct, common bile duct, right and left hepatic duct, the hepatopancreatic duct, everything is normal. They function normally. But still, I mean, there is no obstruction. If the lumen is clear, everything is clear. But still, patient is going to have increase in levels of conjugated bilirubin. Now that is a very important surprise. How is that going to happen? First of all, let me name it as all these are the obstructive causes. Now let me name it as non-obstructive causes. Non-obstructive causes. Now what are the non-obstructive causes? The first important thing, bacterial infections, parasitic infections, and metabolic problems. What are the bacterial infections? For example, Epstein-Barr virus, right? So what are the problems guys? Bacterial infections, point number one. Bacterial infections, point number two, let us say parasitic infections. And point number three, let us say metabolic problems. Metabolic problems. Now, what are the bacterial infections which you know, guys? For example, Epstein Barr virus. Epstein Barr virus causes non obstructive conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Not only that, parasitic infections like toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis. Not only that, what are the metabolic problems? Metabolic problems like cystic fibrosis or alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency, right? like cystic fibrosis alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency or cystic fibrosis all of them are going to be the non obstructive causes clear so these are few of them there are many of them even the drugs also play a great role in that. I'll be discussing it later on. These are the important things which you need to know regarding the conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Now, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia is happening before the liver or it is happening after the liver. All these biliary tracts are present after the liver. So, there is a problem before the liver or after the liver. It is happening after the liver. So, can I tell it is a post-hepatic jaundice? Yeah. So, this conjugated hyperbilirubinemia is also called as post-hepatic jaundice. Whereas, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia is called as pre-hepatic jaundice. There is pre-hepatic of unconjugated. There is post-hepatic of conjugated. And there is one more thing in the middle that is called as hepatic jaundice. What is hepatic jaundice? If the problem is happening only in the liver, within the liver, that is called hepatic jaundice, where there will be increase in level of unconjugated, increase in level of conjugated, both of them. There is mixed conjugated and unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, right? So this is the basic concept which all of you have to know regarding the normal bilirubin excretion mechanism and also the, the basic the basic things of how the conjugated bilirubin is increased and how the unconjugated bilirubin is increased. Apart from this, apart from this, in the next video I will be discussing a, still what are the causes of conjugated, what are the causes of unconjugated in complete detail, right, for your exam point of view and also I will be discussing 
what is the difference between physiological jaundice and pathological jaundice which is very very important for your exams right so i also told you one thing that where is conjugated bilirubin formed conjugated bilirubin is formed before the liver or after the liver obviously it is formed in the liver but later on it is excreted out of the liver right through the biliary tracts and all so if there is any problem with the obstruction after the liver you call this as a post hepatic jaundice right so increase in level of conjugated bilirubin or conjugated hyperbilirubinemia is also called as post hepatic jaundice now what are the causes guys one is the obstruction i told you obstruction in the sense there can be stones there can be strictures right next thing is primary biliary sclerosis i have explained you i have also explained regarding primary sclerosing cholangitis now there are two more conditions which i have to explain it to you right what are these two more conditions are look here guys for example for example let us say that this is your liver this is your liver right now within the liver you have got what hepatocytes so let me draw let me draw one hepatocyte over here right so this is your hepatocyte obviously all of you know this thing that hepatocytes are uh, hexagonal in shape right so these are the hepatocytes which are hexagonal in shape and next thing is that we also have got something called as gallbladder right so we have got something called as gallbladder here right there is gallbladder and coming out of the gallbladder you have got a duct like this and what is this duct guys yes the name of this duct is cystic duct so let me draw one blood vessel one blood vessel out here right so this is the blood vessel now one very important thing you need to understand is that whenever whenever so we have already discussed that unconjugated bilirubin will come all the way like this right all of you know that unconjugated bilirubin is going to come like this and this unconjugated bilirubin will join with what udp uridyl diphosphate once it joins with the uridyl diphosphate the resultant which is going to form is conjugated bilirubin right and you know what is the enzyme the enzyme is udp glucuronyl transferase so let me just write it down quickly so the enzyme here is udp glucuronyl transferase so this was your enzyme previously and i hope all of you know this enzyme right we have already discussed what happens when there is deficiency of this enzyme now once conjugated bilirubin is formed once conjugated bilirubin is formed this bilirubin has to be stored within your bile and then from the bile it has to be excreted out so if it has to be stored in the bile first of all first of all where does this conjugated bilirubin go conjugated bilirubin enters into the hepatocyte and hepatocyte stores this conjugated bilirubin and hepatocyte secretes this conjugated bilirubin into the gallbladder right so let us say let us say that conjugated bilirubin all the way from here right all the way from here con this conjugated bilirubin right now it entered into your hepatocyte so now you have got conjugated bilirubin in the hepatocyte and this conjugated bilirubin has to enter into what what is this it it entered into the hepatocyte right now once it entered into the hepatocyte but first of all it cannot directly enter into the hepatocyte you need some you know uh, transporter protein right so on the surface on the surface here on the surface of the hepatocyte you have got a nice transporter protein over here and this transporter protein is called as o atp 1b1 now what do you mean what do you mean by this o atp 1b1 yeah this is organic anion transporter protein organic anion transporter protein type 1 b1 okay so this is the protein this is the protein this is a transporter protein that is present on the surface of the hepatocyte which is facing the blood vessel okay so this surface of the hepatocyte is facing the blood vessel on that side you have this protein and with the help of this transporter protein you are transporting conjugated bilirubin into the hepatocyte now once you have transported this conjugated bilirubin into the hepatocyte once you have transported this conjugated bilirubin into the hepatocyte what is happening is 
Now, do you see this membrane of the hepatocyte which is facing towards the bile canaliculi or, or this membrane which is facing towards the gallbladder simply, right? So, this, this membrane which is facing the gallbladder, even that is having, even that is having a special type of protein here, okay? Now, what is the name of this protein over here? The name of this protein is multi drug resistance protein or simply called as MDRP. MDRP stands for multi drug resistance protein. Okay. Now, what, what does this multi drug resistance protein do? What does it do is that the conjugated bilirubin, whatever is formed, right? So, this conjugated bilirubin, whatever is formed, this conjugated bilirubin enters into the gallbladder with the help of this protein called as multi drug resistance protein. So, right now, your formed conjugated bilirubin is in your gallbladder. Now, from here, you know the story, it will be excreted out. And how it is excreted, we have discussed previously, right? Now, what is the important thing I would like to mention here? Important thing is that, in the hepatocyte, not only conjugated bilirubin guys, not only conjugated bilirubin, but also there is one very important metabolite. What is that metabolite? All of you know epinephrine, right? All of you know epinephrine. They are the catecholamines, right? Epinephrine and norepinephrine. So, epinephrine, when you metabolize it, epinephrine is metabolized into metanephrine. Okay? Epinephrine is metabolized into metanephrine. So, there are also metanephrine, I mean metabolites of epinephrine present within this hepatocyte. What are the metabolites of epinephrine? They are metanephrines. So, metanephrines are also present within this hepatocyte. So, I will be writing metanephrine as MN, okay? Or simply MT. MT stands for metanephrine. So, there are metanephrine molecules. There are metanephrine molecules located within your hepatocyte. Okay, so what is the big deal about this? Now, these metanephrines along with your bile, these metanephrines along with your bile, it has to be excreted out because metanephrines are really toxic to you. So, you have to uh, remove the metabolites out of your body, right? Once anything is metabolized, you have to remove them out of your body, you have to excrete them out of your body. So, for that reason, for that reason, these metanephrines, even these metanephrines, they enter into the gallbladder with the same transporter protein that is MDRP transporter protein. Clear? So, even they are entering into, look here, even they are entering into the gallbladder with the help of the same transporter protein. So, finally, we have got our metanephrines here. Now, obviously, even they will be excreted out. The metanephrines also will be excreted out. So, this thing basically happens in you and me. Normally, it happens in everyone. If I add a clinical thing on this, what are the clinical things which we can discuss here? The important thing which we can discuss here is what if, what if OATP 1B1, right? OATP 1B1 transporter protein or, or let us say the gene which is synthesizing this which is coding for this OATP 1B1 is defective or mutated. So, in that case is OATP 1B1 production is stopped. So, obviously there won't be any OATP 1B1. When there is no OATP 1B1 protein, do you think conjugated bilirubin from the, the blood circulation, will it enter into the hepatocyte? No. So, what will happen? What will happen eventually guys? What will happen is, within the blood, the levels of conjugated bilirubin, they spike up, they increase. So, can I tell this deficiency of OATP or defect, defective OATP 1B1 is responsible for conjugated hyperbilirubinemia? Yeah. So, can I write it down here? O ATP 1B1 defect causes increase in level of conjugated bilirubin. Next important thing. Next important thing is that, okay, let us say we got a patient, right? Now in that patient, his OATP 1B1 protein was working normally. There is no problem with that. 
So when there is no problem with that, conjugated bilirubin, once it is formed, it will very nicely enter into the hepatocyte. Now once it enters into the hepatocyte, now conjugated bilirubin along with, along with the metanephrines, right? The metabolites of epinephrine are called as metanephrine, I told you. So conjugated bilirubin along with the metanephrines have to enter or have to be secreted into the gallbladder. So for that, this part of the membrane which is facing towards the gallbladder is having another protein and that is called as multi-drug resistance protein as I told you. Now, let us say, let us say for example, in this patient, this OATP1B1 is working normally, conjugated bilirubin entered into the hepatocyte, the moment it entered into the hepatocyte, right now, his MDR protein is defective. There is defectiveness in multi-drug resistance protein. Now, when there is defect in this multi-drug resistant protein, do you think conjugated bilirubin can enter into the gallbladder? No, cannot enter into the gallbladder. So eventually what is happening? Within the hepatocyte, the levels of conjugated bilirubin are increasing. Right? So within the hepatocyte, there is increase in levels of conjugated bilirubin. Not only conjugated bilirubin, but also the metanephrine level is also increasing because as I told you, metanephrines also are getting secreted into the gallbladder with the help of the same transporter protein. So if that is defective, then both conjugated bilirubin and metanephrines level is increased within the hepatocyte. So what is the great deal between this? The great deal, what you can find here is, if there is increase in level of conjugated bilirubin, you call this as conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. That is different. But the important thing to note down here is, if there is increase in level of metanephrines, these metanephrines, they impart dark color to the hepatocyte. So I have just explained you one hepatocyte here. Think there are thousands and thousands of hepatocytes all over your liver. Now, in all these hepatocytes, there is excess amount of metanephrines imparting complete dark color to the liver. So, can I call this patient who is having dark color consistency of the liver as dark liver disease? Right? So, this patient is having dark liver. Why? Because there is defect in multi drug resistant protein. Now, this patient where there is defect in multi-drug resistance protein resulting in dark discoloration of the liver along with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, this condition my friends it is called as Dubin-Johnson syndrome. This is called as Dubin-Johnson syndrome. Next important thing is that as I already told you, OATP1B1 defectiveness causes increase in level of conjugated bilirubin within the blood, right? So if this thing is happening, this disease, this, this syndrome, you call it as Rotar syndrome. Rotar syndrome. So I hope you understood what is Dubin-Johnson syndrome and on the other hand, you also understood what is Rotar syndrome. So this is your Dubin-Johnson and this is your, this is your Dubin-Johnson and that's your Rotar syndrome.